the things that you had to do to, to really grind and hustle and get the business off the ground are, are going, if you keep doing those things, they're going to stop you from going to that next level. Mm -hmm. And some of that is being really okay with the fact that you are not going to be able to keep the people that started you in the business around for the, the length of the growth of the business. They're Welcome to the Painter Growth Podcast, where we help you scale your painting company in record time. Join us as we explore sales, marketing, hiring, finances, leadership, and more, everything that you need to know to scale and grow your painting business. I hope you enjoy and subscribe. What's up, everybody? Mike Hickman here, founder of PainterGrowth.com, and you guys are listening to the Painter Growth Podcast. And I got a special one for you today. We are joined, I am joined, and you too, I guess, if you're listening, um, by Mr. Zach Johnson. Now, Zach is the head coach here at Painter Growth. You don't see him very much. He's behind the scenes. He works with our other coaches uh, and sharpens their saws so that they can be the best uh, with our clients. And Zach has a ton of experience coaching. Really stoked to talk to him today about the most sexiest topic ever, which is systems. So we're going to talk about you know why you need them, how to build them how to make it maybe a little bit easier for you. But uh, Zach, what's up, man? Glad to have you here. Hey, glad to be here, Mike. Um, systems, yeah, well, hey. <laughs> Maybe a bit of a challenge to make it sexy, but we'll we'll, we'll give it a good shot. We'll do our best. So uh, just give us a quick um, quick credibility booster. Why, why are you in the seat that you're in? Oh, man, well, hey, uh, we, have to go, we have to go back, you know, 15 years ago, I guess, in college, running a painting business, uh, did pretty well, got tapped on the shoulder to start managing, running, and uh, and hiring painting businesses for a large franchise company, and got got into systems. I think that's that's the connection point. Um, but between then and and now, um, did a lot of uh, I've done a lot of executive coaching. And, uh, and so I, I have a, a love for, we'll say the small business entrepreneurs of the world and, uh, and getting to the point where you can kind of build something so that it works for you. But, uh, yeah, I, I think that's a pretty quick overview. We can definitely dive into corners of it more. As yeah. we, as we so at, at your most, what was the most number of franchisees you ever kind of oversaw at any given, at one given time? Uh, with two different franchise systems, about 200. So to manage and to to help and to coach and train two hundred franchisees, uh, you kind of need to have pretty good systems. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess you know, top line busiest season, kind of that you know, that's about fifteen hundred employee range, and then two hundred franchises and, and, and a, a slew of upper management. And absolutely, the systems, the things that and keep it from going off the rails. And, and what so did you feel? What did you find was the hardest time. part of that? that role? Oh, boy. Great question. Um, you know what, off the top of my head, I'd have to say, there is a point to where you recognize how much you should be doing and how much you shouldn't be doing. And I guess what I mean by that is, is this a fire I need to put out? Do I need to die in the fill? Or can I get someone else to help me with it? Mm -hmm. Give me an example of that. Sure. So like, uh, you know, it was a crazy lawsuit with somebody who had uh, ignorantly maybe ignored some of the important parts of the training and put a bunch of interior paint on the exterior of the house. And you start working through it and you realize that uh, actually, you know, it looks hairy and it looks ugly, but actually with with a degree of help from uh, experienced paint reps and uh, a few other experienced painters, you can get it solved without you having to go and uh, roll up your sleeves. <laughs> Fair enough. So how would you, uh, how would you, you know, the, the term systems is thrown around often and we've done, I've done several podcast episodes about systems. Um, so if, if you've been listening to a lot of episodes, you know, thank you. And you probably have this knowledge already, but how would you describe uh, just high level? What is a system in a business? I think a system is a structure that allows a problem to be solved with you not having to intervene. Okay. And what does like a system allow you to do as a business owner? Well, you, could, you get to step back essentially. 
And the more you get to step back from a lot of the day to day things, the bigger it allows you to grow it. So you can essentially get to the point where you can have a business that allows you to take multiple months off in a row or build a second business or a third or a fourth or a 10th. But the systems are what allow you to do that without you having to worry that it's going to fall down mm -hmm. while you're away. Okay. And um, I mean, it sounds like a great, a great thing, right? And it's like, <laughs> just by that definition, it's like, hey, everyone should have tons of systems in their businesses because it's like, wow, that sounds awesome. Uh, why, why do people uh, resist implementing systems? I mean, there's probably some, some core motivational psychology in that and that we tend to some validation and some, some ego that gets put into play when we solve problems that we're good at solving. So we get really used to solving a problem. We're great at it. We can do it super fast. Then the problem that you've got, you know, not to overuse the word problem, but maybe the conundrum you find yourself in is, do I train somebody to fix this problem? And it might take me six, seven, eight hours to train someone, or do I do it in 20 minutes? And that's a really hard thing to contend with. And most of the time we tend to go, well, shit, I'm good at it. Let me just knock it out and then keep rolling instead of passing the many years of experience you have in learning how to solve that problem quickly on to somebody else. Yeah. So basically you're saying like it might take, you know, it might take you 10 minutes to do something. Say it's something like, you know, doing a uh doing a touch-up right you know your painters finish there's a couple touch-ups or you're there collecting the checks so you might as well just finish the touch-ups and then move on right because only takes you 10 minutes you know seemingly no cost but then realistically like for you to you know put this put the systems in place the training the the accountability the support the qa to get your painters to actually handle those touch-ups like you're, you're talking hours and hours 10 plus hours like you said so putting that work up front when it's like hey i, I can just do it i might as well just keep doing it because it's like it's like, doesn't take a lot of time. It's not that hard, but like creating that system would be so much harder in the short term, but like long term, it would ultimately free you up so much more. Absolutely. And so the trade off in that moment is absolutely painful. Like it's really difficult to see past it. There's a, there's an author I like, his name is Rory Vaden, and he's got a book where he, he outlines that if it takes you 30 times longer to train somebody then it takes to do it you should still train somebody which is like man that is a that is an incredible number in the moment when you're like i could just go resolve this angry customer i know i can handle them i know how to work through it or i could like handhold somebody through it they're gonna mess it up multiple times and then i still have to kind of half fix it and that's a hard it's a miserable trade-off in the moment especially when you've got nine other plates you're spinning yeah, if you say it's 30, yeah, the, the nine other plates thing for sure. Like you say 30 times more. So say something takes you half an hour once a week. So to create that system 30 times more is going to be 15 hours. So basically two full days. But yeah, now you need to like reschedule other things, reprioritize. You're now not doing estimates. You're not doing marketing. You're not producing. You're not picking up paint. You're not talking to customers. You're just working on this one process that is going to save you 30 minutes a week. It's like it's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Absolutely. It's so difficult to see, especially when you consider the fact that you're like, okay, mentally, I mean, let's top of the top of the spectrum. I got to take two full days out to train this, but the reason, and he, he breaks it down in detail, but obviously you do a few of these things and then it's a half hour task every week so that it saves you 25 hours a year. And you get one more office if you know, 25 hours a year, half an hour a week, 52 weeks. So then very soon, you can see the compounding benefits of it, but in the moment, it's a really difficult decision to make. Have you ever read, I'm sure you have, because you read like a million books, but have you ever read Buy Back Your Time by Dan Martell? I actually haven't. You no, haven't? I've okay. seen that book. I just finished it, and it's really, really wonderful for anyone that's super busy. Um, one of the concepts that he talks about in there is like your replacement value. So say your business is making you know, 200K a year. And out of that 200K, um, how many hours are there in the, how many work hours are there in a year again? 68 times 52. Anyway, so about hundred, $100 an hour, right? So the, his thing is, I think it's 25% of your, your hourly rate should be the replacement value. So if your business is pulling in 200K a year, that's $100 an hour on average. Um, and so you should be delegating 
anything that you can delegate for $25 an hour or less. Mm. So if you're painting, you can pay someone $25 an hour. If you're doing bookkeeping, you can get someone 20 bucks an hour, you know, whatever, like whatever you can delegate for less than a quarter of your annual business's earnings, you should be off offloading so that you can now spend that time on higher value tasks. That's, that's a great, I think it's a great place to start in terms of metric and looking at it. Because one of the things that is a really, I'm going to say the pain point for a lot of people is hiring an admin. They, they know they need one, especially, you know, in painter growth, they know they need one, but they're not really sure of where to start because a lot of the things they know how to do, they can do quickly, but they do a lot of these quick things, 20, 30, 40 of them every week. And so it's a, it's a difficult dynamic to start to go, Hey, how do I translate this task and get it to somebody? And I mean, that's a great place to, start, place to start because a lot of what we recommend is, hey, get somebody for three hours a week. Small, like start small and just get a few things that are easy, kind of dummy proof, get them off your plate and then slowly mm -hmm. more on that person. But I mean, I relate a lot to that right now in, in my business, well, in painter growth right now, like running this company, because um, it's becoming like, you know, little, little tasks that I have to do. Like if they rely on me, they're not going to get done well because I'm doing a lot of other things. So um, even things like, um, you know, like I have a monthly payroll task that takes me like one hour, one and a half hours every single month. But like, it's just been really hard to like create that system for it. And I, I still haven't, but I know I have to. And the reason I haven't is because like two factor authentication is really tricky when you're talking about like payroll stuff. Um, but anyway, it's like little things like that. Now I'm at the point where, you know, one hour a month is, is, is the level of the system that I'm trying to offload, but, but you need to keep doing that. And I think I've said this like a hundred times, right? Your ability to scale your business is limited only by your ability to delegate more and more complex tasks, right? You've heard me say that before yeah. probably a dozen times, <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's so true. Um, and if you give up trying to delegate something, that's where, you know, you get stuck here and a system helps you delegate it. Absolutely. And, and I think that the other side of a system is that you can't expect it to be perfect the first time around. If it's going to be a, your shitty first draft so to speak, right? You're going to get it in place and then you're going to work through it a couple of times and iron out the kinks. And it'll, it'll take a couple of iterations before it's, it's mostly locked and loaded and has gone through a few edits. So, yeah, I mean, there's so many, I mean, so many clients of ours who, you know, we speaking about that admin who go in and they finally pull the trigger on hiring a virtual assistant. And, you know, we have, we have support around that and we help with recruiting and training and your virtual assistants and all that stuff. But the amount of time that it frees someone up, like you have no idea until you actually have someone coming in and, doing your calls and calling your clients and scheduling jobs and, you know, organizing your finances and your receipts and your, all of that stuff. It's like it, those little things add up to big things. Absolutely. And I, I think that also the understanding is that like, if you, if you can just try it for a while, you are comfortable with the fact that someone's kind of in your, in your space, right there, that can be the uncomfortable dynamic is that I've done this for 10, 15, 20 years. I know how to do it. I don't want someone looking at maybe all my numbers or my organization system that I know should be better. But if you can just baby step into it, you get to see really quickly the, the rewards of the time that you get back. Mm -hmm. Because that time is, is so important, obviously, to be able to push the business forward, doing the things only you can do. So how, I mean, we have priority management training, obviously, you know, we've talked about it before. I think I've given away the toolkits on this um, podcast several times, but um, how do you recommend someone like goes through what they're currently doing in a week to figure out what they should systemize first, systemize or delegate? Well, I think one of the easiest ways is to do the kind of 168 hour test. You just document what you spend time on over the course of a week and go, okay, and often that's a really surprising task when you look at it because we have an idea when we're busy that we're busy and all things are equally important. But when we document what we do over the course of a week and we go, okay, let's, I know I sleep for, let's say eight hours a night in the top end. Okay. It's 56 hours. I spend this much time, you know, going to the gym, this much time grocery shopping. And then I look at all my work tasks and I look at the fact, okay, I spent this much time at the paint store. I spent this much time talking to clients. I spent this much time, I don't know, harassing painters with touch-ups very quickly you start to get to the point where you have these blocks where man if i could just not do this one task that would free me up three hours this week and then obviously three hours over the course of 52 weeks is, is a lot of time yeah you start big and then you get small right like first thing is you know is like how do i get out of painting because anyone anyone listening to this is someone who wants to scale a painting business 
I imagine. And if you're still painting, I've said this before, that's the least productive thing that you can do in your painting business is paint. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, it's a it's a tricky thing because again, you're the expert in that in that time frame. But you have to. It's really important to be able to recognize, if you can, for a moment that you know, two years from now, three years, four or five years from now, that you'll be working on a skill set that is very different. You'll be hiring, training people, like working on large commercial bids, whatever it may be, that you will build a different level of competency. And to get past the fact that you might be super competent. So I, I give an example, uh, you know, this, this client will remain anonymous, but painting business grew it from about 750 to 1.3, 1.4 um, in the course of about a year uh, with one of our guys. And one of the big differences, there was a lot of painful selling, like get off the brush, get off the brush, get off the brush. Well, I'm great at it. I'm great at it. I'm great. And yeah very talented incredibly talented painter uh but the amount of time so it was a slow progression i hired a pro like a, a project manager didn't work out I hired a second one didn't work out I hired a third one finally gave him some bandwidth was able to do some of the basic things um that uh that were required to be able to like support some of the quality issues that kept coming up because that's why most guys or a lot of guys will hop in a brush it's like okay this is tricky this is a high skilled, I don't know, stairwell that I'm painting out with some weird crown molding or whatever it might be. I'll do it. But you have to look at that as a, as a progression. Okay, maybe I, I paint a lot. Okay, how can I paint the specific things? Well, I paint the specific things. How can I delegate that? How can I transfer that skill set? Finally, transfer the skill set and has way more time to book jobs. And now we're looking at transferring that skill set. How do you hire somebody to actually do the sales? But it's a massive jump, like double the business, being able to just get off the brush. And, and that's a, it's a hard thing to see in the moment, but you, you can recognize that, look, there are guys that have 10, 20, 30 million, 100, you know, massive painting businesses. They're definitely not on the brush. They're definitely not doing touch-ups. So it's, it's, some of it is having faith in a bigger vision for yourself five years down the road. It's funny. The, the, CEOs that I know of eight figure painting businesses, they don't even have a job within their company. They walk around their office, they're figureheads, right? They walk around, they say hi, you know, they maybe do a little safety meeting on the site one day just for fun. But like the people who truly have businesses that have scaled do not have a role anymore because they've been able to leverage through people because nothing is nothing is not delegatable. Nothing is unique to only you as the business owner you're the only one that has, and I've struggled with this in my business now and my, my painting business for a little while, but this one now too, it's like, nothing is unique to me. There are smart freaking people out there who are way better at, you know, one thing than I'm at, I'm, I'm at. So why can't I find one person to tackle one specific part of my business? So I don't need to worry about that anymore. And I've been experiencing that recently with hiring managers in different positions. And it's been like amazing, like the amount of mental capacity that frees up. Well, it's funny to think that you need to be the best at nothing in your business. You just need to be the best at hiring people who are better at it than you. Yeah, the thing about Elon, uh, you know, Elon Musk, he is not the best engineer. He's a good engineer, right? Definitely incredible engineer. He's a visionary. You know what? I'd say he's probably the best visionary in the world, right? But he's not the best engineer. He's not the best operator. He's not the best product guy. He's not the best material scientist, but he knows how to hire those people. Actually, he's probably one level. Right. He knows how to hire the people who can hire those people. Right, because there might be a better visionary sitting somewhere in his mom's basement. But without the ability to hire people who are better at the actual things you need done than you, nothing goes, nothing moves forward. 100%. Um, so now bringing that like to, to practicality. So, you know, to identify, you said 168 hours, right? Identify kind of what you're doing. We prioritize it based on um, what takes a lot of hours and, and trying to remove those. What do you feel like um, are some like, what's like the head junk that people tell themselves as to why they cannot systemize or delegate a certain task? I think the number one, like right off the bat is like, it's a, there's a value aspect. There's an ego component to it. Like it's hard. Therefore it's valuable. Therefore I need to do it. Like this, this needs to be done. Or like I need to be the, 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 
the biggest warrior at the front of the army with the biggest sword. And it's like, no, you, your painting business is not contingent on you being the best painter by a long shot. You do not need to lead based on just skill. That is, that is not a requirement mm -hmm. at all. But there's a, I think there's a lot, there's maybe an old fashioned, or I would say maybe just a, a belief that people will leave me if I don't, if I don't demonstrate my capacity and my skill set regularly. Like if I'm not on the job site with the guys on a regular basis, they're not going to, they're going to lose respect for me. And they're going to leave. And I, I can't have that. As opposed I to, I think I had a client actually, yesterday, actually. Um, he asked me, he's like, if I hire, if I hire a PM, an external PM who doesn't have painting experience, how are they going to get the respect of the painters? It's like, he doesn't need to be a good painter. He just needs to be a good leader. So can you like Most explain the difference different. between leadership characteristics and technical skill and how, how they kind of work together on the job site? Yeah. Well, you brought up Elon Musk as an example, right? And I think that, you know, there's a, in his first autobiography, there's a, there's a kind of a little anecdote where he talks about the fact that he, he showcased uh, there's a bunch of engineers that were doing their job. And so he's like, fine, I'm frustrated. I'm just going to pull an all nighter do the week's worth of work that I was waiting for and make you look like an idiot the next morning and did that, but then recognized very quickly that, oh man, I can't continue to do this. So there's a followership dynamic that is different than needing to be stronger and bigger and better and more competent. And the major difference is if you are organized, you set clear instructions for what people need to do. And there's a recognition that like, Hey, you're the painter. You're better at painting than me. I'm the project manager. My job is not to paint. My job is to make sure you can paint really well. But if that, if that level of clarity is there, then there's no competition. Like I don't expect to be better at painting than you as a project manager. And the, the painter should be clear about the fact that there should be no need to be better and there should be no skill comparison. It's, it, it's not, it, it's never going to be a pissing contest. Yeah. The painter is always going to be better. Project manager is going to be better at project managing because they're two very different roles. One person's role is to like row the boat. And the other person's role is to steer the boat. It, they're not, it's not a competition of, of rowing in this case. Um, this might be a little bit of like a sidetrack from what we're talking about here, but I feel like it kind of fits in because I've had a few people um, mention this recently in the community and stuff and would love to hear just kind of your thoughts on this. But what do you do when a painter is demonstrating dissent to a PM or the owner? As in like, I'm not going to do that because I think it's dumb. Because I think or like I'm going to paint it my own way. Uh, you know, it's okay if I show up at 830 or nine, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, I just take long lunches because I take long lunches. Like, you know, I don't need to listen to your processes. This is how I do it. Like that type of descent. Gotcha. I think it comes down to being really clear on like a working agreement and expectation. So every, you're going to have issues and there are always issues. And especially with, we'll say, older blue ticket red seal painters that have been around for a long time. Um, a hard, a hard dynamic is setting a very clear understanding for good reasons. So uh, i give you an example. Um, I have a guy that has a, he's a good painter. He's a solid painter. He's not the best painter, but he expects a raise every year. Okay. So one of our members is like, we're, we're having a conversation around this guy is just keeps asking for a raise. Smart guy, smart painter, but he's like, I can't keep paying him more especially because he's not increasing his level of, of productivity. So we had to kind of break it down and look at what the productivity was across those other painters and look at the productivity per hour per job. And so he made a very clear case. He's like, look, I, I basically, without, without drastically increasing my prices for your jobs, I can't pay you more. Especially when we look at the fact that there's a multitude of other painters on my, on our, on my crew, like in this company, paint faster than you. They actually produce more than you do. And so I'm not saying it's an easy solution. It's a case by case basis, but I, a working agreement can be a really useful tool to say, look, like you work here, you show up at this time, you work at this time, 
this is what a lunch break looks like. And often we talk about like revisions to that type of a document, but much of it is the ability to be able to explain why it is that we do what we do and get people to initial it and I'd like to agree on it. And you can bring up that document because it keeps the feelings out of it. Hey, I, I get that this is frustrating. I get you on a long lunch break. I get that you busted your ass in the last job and you feel like you deserve to take Friday afternoon off on this job. But this working agreement that we have, you initialed, we agreed. This is how we do business here. Mm -hmm. I think some of that probably also comes down to like having clear expectations is great, but some of it comes down to like how you're showing up as a leader, right? Are you, are you on time? Are you organized? Do you have your shit together? Are you like communicative? Do you pay on time? Do you always have good jobs lined up? Like, you know, do you keep your vehicle clean? Like, I think all of those things as well. Um, are you decisive? Right. I think all of those things contribute to how much, a, a, you know, a more of experienced painter would listen to you versus, you know, try to like, you know, who, like you said before, like the pissing contest, like who's going to be the, who is the alpha in that, in that relationship? And can you like show them that like, no, this is not how we do it. I'm more organized than you. I got my shit together. That's why you're painting for me and not the other way around. Yeah. yeah. Organization is massive. I think because it generally indicates that you're doing your part, like you're busy steering the ship, right? You're making sure the marketing engine is running and you're putting work in front of people. The Oftentimes, I think that, especially if you get a lot of pushback, sometimes the ability to explain within context, like I can't pay you more because, you know, these are the margins that make the wheels go around on this thing. Like mm -hmm. you don't see a lot of all of these costs, right? You're, you're not aware of the, the uh, issues I have to deal with and the marketing that goes into it and the Facebook ads and, you know, the, the, the tax structure and the cost per acquisition and the slippage and all the different things that go in, whereas you get a painter it's like, I just deserve 50% of this job. And you're like, well, so sometimes context, organization, absolutely. Decisiveness, totally. And the understanding that like, there are always, I say this carefully, but there are always other options. Like don't stick with the person that you've been with for years, just because you have a good relationship with them, even though you've decided to pay them 60% of your every job. And, um, you know, you've got a, I don't know, a working level of trust with them. Like we see this a lot, I would say on average too, is like weird exceptions being made for one or two individuals. And that's a really dangerous way to lead when you've got a team of people that you've set a different standard with and you've got your two old dogs who have been around for a while, but they get special treatment. Yeah, I think it's okay, like early on in your business, when you need that cash flow, you need a reliable painter to pay them a little bit more so they can just take a bit more off your plate. But as the company grows, you get more people in place. It's like, no, I can't pay you 50% or 60% anymore. Because like, now I have a production manager, you know, who's taking a lot on a lot of that additional responsibility. And like, I guess, you can give them the option to either like, grow with the company grow, you know, and develop with the company and you know, the new expectations or you know, it's hard to do in business with emotions and everything, but like, you know, pushing people out, even if they're decent performers, if they're not the right fit anymore, like, you know, what you said earlier, I actually said offline, right? Like what got you here? Won't get you there. Yeah. That's a, that's a great book, but it really is the challenge of recognizing that, you know, the things that you had to do to, to really grind and hustle and get the business off the ground are, are, going if you keep doing those things they're going to stop you from going to that next level mm -hmm. and some of that is being really okay with the fact that you are not going to be able to keep the people that started you in the business around for the the length of the growth of the business there's um dynamic and I, i'm trying to remember the name of it exactly but i think it's called the uh the founder complex where um, I'm not getting the name quite right, but so often founders of a company are not the people that run it to its highest zenith. So they get the people that start it, the scrappy hustlers. Founders often, dilemma. Founders dilemma. Yes, yeah. that's what it is. Thank you. And it's a, it's a funny, it's a kind of a unique thing to consider that the person who really was able to like, you know, be scrappy and dynamic and fast paced and grind at all hours is, is not the skill set required to get it to 
penetrate different markets and to really, really scale it at large? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's happened recently with, uh, not super recently, but happened a few years ago with Uber, right? The CEO or the founder right. grew it to billions and billions of dollars and he got pushed out because he wasn't the right, he wasn't the right guy to, to continue it on that next phase of growth. Totally. And so, you know, within your own company, it doesn't obviously mean you need to go hire a CEO to run your own company, but it does mean you need to think about the fact that you're going to need to work on different skill sets to get past different plateaus. Mm -hmm. So other than the, um, if you go back now to the topic of today, just so we don't get too far off, right? We're talking about building systems and processes to allow you to scale. Um, and then we talked about the head trash kind of the, the people go through, um, and kind of getting in your own way. What other kind of trends do you see? You know, you talk to a lot of, of our, you know, our bigger businesses, uh, and our coaches who are dealing with these, you know, these clients who just, as much as you try to sell them on building a system for a certain task, they still don't do it. Right. Even though they know it's in their best interest, they know they need to do it to free up their time, but like you lead a horse to water, but they still don't drink it. Like, why do you think that is? Where, what's going on there with like the human psychology? It's like, this isn't your best interest. You need to do it. Why aren't you doing it? I think some of it has to do with what makes, I think humans in general, I'll put it on all of us, have a hard time understanding the implications of compounding. We can see a linear line easier, right? And I'll, I'll reduce it to a, maybe a, a, a prehistoric example. But like, if I go hunt two deer, I can eat for three weeks or two months. I can eat for you know, a really clean amount of time, but it's very difficult for me to comprehend how if I, if I build a fence and I put a bunch of deer in that fence and they continue to reproduce that I can eat for years and years and years and years. And the compounding just concept is sometimes hard to wrap our brain around. And so it's, it's a really difficult thing to go, oh man, I know I need to get a CRM. I know I need to get a piece of software. And, and software is a phenomenal leverage. Right? Because there was a point in time in which we had to pay an employee to do that. When you think that I can pay essentially, if I have a CRM in place, I pay 200 bucks a month. I would have had to have paid a full-time salary for somebody to manage that in a filing cabinet at some point in time. But you know, that's a, another you know, dynamic in, in itself is to say, look, like what this, what this piece of software does is so easily justified in terms of cost. But it's to be able to look really far in advance, five years in the future and go, okay, if I get this, I know this adoption of the software is going to be painful. I need to take my skewed mess on my desktop that I've been doing for 10 plus years and put it all into a piece of software. Well, it's going to take me a good couple of weeks. That's going to be just painful. I got to learn it. I got to transfer it. I got to double check everything. There's going to be hiccups and problems. But then I can get somebody else in it and, and I can get, I can put an admin in it. I can get my sales guys in it, and I can get my painters. In it. And all of a sudden now there's this network of systems that support many of the things that I knew only how to do at one point in time. And that's the compounding dynamic, but it's hard to confirm in the moment or even forecast in the moment, how much time that's going to save me. Mm hmm yeah, how much time it's going to save you, but also how much time is going to take up front. I think that's the thing that people are scared about is like doing something different up front that, you know, whenever, whenever there's uncertainty in a task, I think human nature is to choose inaction. So if you have like a project on your plate that you've been meaning to do for a really long time, I'm sure everyone listening to this can relate to this. Right now, you have something that you want to do, whether it's like you want to start a door-to-door -door team or you want to find a marketing agency or you want to you know, start Facebook ads or you want to hire a production manager. You think about this task and it's just like, it's such a monumental task if you don't break it down. It's like, okay, I want to hire a production manager. You don't schedule on your calendar a two-hour block that says hire a production manager. Right. It, it, that that would be become something where you get to that and you like you just would do nothing. But it's like, how do you break that down into actual actionable tasks that you can knock off in 15 or 30 minutes? Like figure out how much I need to I can pay a production manager and then write the job description and then, you know, post the ad on Indeed and then, you know, comb through interviews. And each one of those is like a one hour task that you can easily put in your calendar. But if you just keep it as the big elephant you're never going to be able to, you're never going to do it. You're just going to keep kicking it down the road. 
Oh man, hundred percent. Like to quote James Clear, right from Atomic Habits, he'd say, "You want to start going to the gym, and the first couple times, just go to the gym, open the door, shut the door, and go home." To get used to the lowest barrier of entry to start that habit, and much of the time we'd say, "Go look at, go look at the software. Just tell it, like, figure out how much it costs per month, and then we'll talk about it again next week." Like, don't worry about buying it. Don't worry about like even doing an onboarding or a free demo. Just go look at it. Because it is, it's a big, hairy, audacious task. It's this ugly thing that grows its own legend, right? It just grows more teeth and more fangs the longer you believe it. Um, I heard one. I don't know if it was the same Atomic Habits, but it's like if you want to start running and you're just like, you can't, you don't, you've never ran before and you just want to start getting in the habit of running, just, just put on your shoes. Go sit on your stairs by your front door and put on your shoes and that's it. And just do that every day and see what happens. <laughs> Absolutely. Because otherwise we're going to very quickly choose another competent task that we know how to do. We crush it out. We feel good about ourselves as opposed to tasks that we're not competent in. We're not competent in the CRM. We're not competent in building out a new system or an SOP or a job description. We're very competent at selling another job. We're super competent at getting painters on that job. And so it, 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 the baby steps, like quite literally with a running shoe analogy, it is massive. Do less than you think you can. A little, uh, actually a little, I don't know if there's a hack or a tip or a whatever tactic that, that someone could try. If you have an admin person or you have another person on your team um, and you want to schedule time to, to like build out a specific process of, a, you know, say it's a billing process or admin or marketing process or sales process. You want to just like take time to document it create like an event in your calendar for when you want to do it and invite someone else to that event. Like if you have a virtual assistant already or an admin or a secretary or something like invite that person to the event and like have a zoom meeting with them at that time. And just like do it together. <laughs> right. And then you have some accountability, even if it's like it'll, it'll kind of force accountability. Anything to get the ball rolling. There's a, there's a guy who writes a book called Indistractable, and he's got just a long list of things that you can do to like just leverage yourself to get it going. Like mm. pay a friend at a hundred bucks and say, don't give the money back to me unless I give you a shitty first draft of this SOP in a month from now. Yeah. Like what, whatever it is to get the, just the, the movement happening, because most of the time, like you said, it's not actually that bad. But mm. if you do put it in this, if you say just hire a production manager, well, there's 20 constituent tasks that go into that. But I can't, I have to break it down and I have to look at it from a step-by-step -step process. And I also have to look at it from like just doing less than I would like to in every step of the way, because then I don't ever think, like a lot of good entrepreneurs, it's the, it's almost the Stockdale paradox in the sense that I have to be realistic and optimistic at the same time. But many good entrepreneurs will be like, no problem, I can knock that out. And it actually takes longer. Like you need to, you need, it's a good thing to say, oh, I can, I can knock that task out. No problem, I can figure that out. When in fact it takes longer than you think. So the inverse of that is to do just a little less and to stretch it over a longer period of time. And you'd be amazed at what you can accomplish in a quarter and, and not think that I just need to get it done in two weeks. And that's the advantage of a coach, really, is someone who just goes, hey, are we breaking it down small enough? Are you moving towards it? Because you'd be amazed at what you can do over the course of a year. And, and probably sometimes like you overestimate what you think you can do in two weeks, but you're floored at what you can hand, like, manage over the course of you know, a quarter. Yeah. Yeah. Play on the, the like whoever said that original quote, one year, 10 years. But um i mean that accountability having a coach is huge it's hard when you're an entrepreneur and you're by yourself and you just every single day like who are you bouncing ideas off of like a toxic facebook group or like your spouse who's sick of hearing it <laughs> but like having a coach for every week or every two weeks you can get on and sit down and have like a one hour chat about you about your business about your problems and have like a qualified person who you can like who actually like understands you and understands where you're at and has been there and gives you advice and problem solves and just like supports you. Make sure that you're you're not not solving the problems you're working on, but make sure you're working on the right problems. I think that's a big problem that a lot of entrepreneurs face is that it's not that you're not working hard. Every single person here listening to this podcast works their ass off. But 
are you working on the right things for the right amount of time in order to fully optimize the the the, the future of your business? Oh, Mass, I mean, I have a coach, you have a coach. The major advantage of a coach is not giving you the answer. It's just in basically having them force you to think about, is this the most important thing? And I uh, progressively taking steps towards it. Because so much of the progress that we make, especially when we're learning a new skill set, is that incremental baby step, just dynamic of, of a little bit every day. Yeah. And that's that's really it. And and so much of the time a coach I think becomes a really useful tool when you've watched yourself over the course of two or three years kind of just stay in the same place. Yeah, as you do make progress, you know, I've I've struggled with this is just like giving myself permission to like be happy with the progress that I have made. Like I'm as an entrepreneur, I'm very uh I'm very uh like not anxious, but just like consistently dissatisfied with where the business is at. But then if I like take a minute and pause and like even six months ago or 12 months ago, I look at where we were in terms of like revenue and profit and what I'm doing with my time and the team and, um, and the systems that we have. And like, it's, it's really cool to like, look at how far you can actually come in a year. If you have a coach and you're, you're doing the hard thing every single day, you're showing up, you're building systems. You're not just working in the business. Um, like now, you know, 70% of my time, is spent working with my team. I do very little coaching. <laughs> is working with my team and doing podcasts. And that's probably the highest leverage use of my time. Not even working with my team, working with my leaders now, which is cool. It's a whole nother, another level. It's a fine balance between giving yourself a good pat on the back and, and also saying it's, a, you know, it's okay for me to continue to grow a little bit too. Yeah, absolutely. Cool, man. Well, that was a... That was a fun conversation. I wasn't sure which way that was going to go, but but uh, I enjoyed our chat, dude. As always, enlightening. Yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> dude, cool. Gonna, um, you know, any uh, business. any last words of uh, motivation for the listeners who who made it all the way to the end? It's supposed to be hard. I think that's the thing that it's what makes it great, right? Or else, if it was easy, everybody would do it. So when you're growing and you're scaling a business, it it's going to be tricky. It's going to require you to like reframe what you thought you were good at or put aside what you were good at in order to learn something that you're not as good at. But remember that I think this is the biggest thing. When you start something new, you'll be the crappiest you ever were when you start. It's like only uphill after that. Love it, man. Very wise words. Sweet, Zach. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for coming on today. Yeah, absolutely. Talk soon. Thanks for listening to the Painter Growth Podcast. If you want to grow your painting business, go to www.paintergrowth.com or click on the top link in the description. Talk soon.